Welcome to the Clive Barker Podcast, Halloween Bonus Episode 2. If you remember around the height of Occupy Midian fever in 2014, Dark Delicacies was putting together a compilation of Nightbreed stories called Midian Unmade. There were many stories that did not get accepted into the book, but what's more Nightbreed than being rejected? These stories are the dead things that don't have enough sense to stay in the ground. And in that spirit, here is my story called Jerry's Left Hand. It combines elements of Cabal and Nightbreed with my experience driving the Alcan Highway several times, and my fears having a new family at the time. I hope you like it. Hear the story that critics are calling cartoony and overwritten. Anne had only been home five minutes when the doorbell rang. She looked down at the floor for two seconds, ran her hands through her long blonde hair, set Kenny in his booster seat to start eating his dinner, and went to the door. It often took all her energy to keep Kenny happy until his bedtime, and it could be a little frustrating to try to keep track of him while talking to whoever this might be at the door. It rang again, and they kept knocking insistently at the same time. The bell was still ringing. That's annoying, she muttered. She undid the deadbolt and opened the door. The first thing she saw when she opened the door was a revolver in her face. Was this a joke? No, it's not funny. Something like this could not ever be funny. If it wasn't a joke, then... Oh, God. Kenny! Let us in, miss, the voice behind the gun said. It was a low, contemptuous growl. It was just below a whisper. He wore a faded black t-shirt with holes in it. The man's face was pockmarked and his head shaved. As they backed into the house, another man came in behind. He shut the door and turned the deadbolt behind him. The second man, she saw, had dyed black hair and wore a gray sweatshirt. What? What do you want? Her mind raced. There had to be a way to get these guys out of the house, get them away from Kenny. We know you're hiding it in here. Where is it? We don't want to spend all night tearing this place apart, and we know you don't want us to do that either. Boss says the breed isn't here, but the god, the god is here somewhere. Part of him, anyway. He moved over to Kenny, pointed the gun at him, at the two-year-old, in his chair. Find it for us now. Anne's thoughts raced, her mind boiled. Hate. All she could feel was hate and death. How could she leave Kenny there? But how could she not? Letting these people keep control was the worst plan, because life seemed cheap to them. It took all of her will, but she went to the spare room. Go with her, he yelled to the hooded man. I don't take orders from you, asshole. Shaved head man pointed the gun at his partner. Do it. I'll remember this, you piece of shit. He grudgingly went to the spare room, where Anne had already found what she was looking for. God, how would this work? She didn't know where or if an opportunity would present itself, but she slipped the scissors into the pouch pocket of her sweatshirt. Fucking ass wipe, he muttered as he came in. So is it in here? Maybe. What does it look like? Jesus, you don't even know what you're looking for? He yelled back to the guy with the shaved head, presumably still pointing his gun at Kenny. She doesn't know what to look for. I can hear, dumbass, he yelled back. Whatever, he grumbled. Like a big potato sack, but wrapped around something. Anne slowly opened the door to the closet and turned on the light. She needed more time. She had no idea what they were looking for. It was probably that they even had the wrong house. What could she do? Maybe confusing them would help? Something like this? She showed them a cardboard mailing tube. He jerked it from her. Does this look like a fucking potato sack to you? Are you an idiot or just trying to waste my time? Sorry, maybe under the bed? Well, go look then. He looked back toward the door, then at her again. Pulling something out of his pocket, he swung it in a criss-cross pattern. The brass thing flipped back and forth in his hand until it stopped. It was a butterfly knife. And knelt down on her side of the bed, wedged between it and the dresser, and looked under. Of course it was exactly as she expected. There was just a tub full of cloth and ping-pong balls. Stuff Emmett used for making puppets in his spare time. I think it's in this tub, but it's kind of wedged in there. Let me look. Anne got up and moved out of the man's way. He did the same as Anne. Lying on his side, he reached his hand under, keeping the knife in his other hand. This thing comes out easy. What the hell are you... 
Before he could finish, Anne was at him. She stabbed his left leg, then pulled the scissors out again. There was an arc of crimson. He yelled and dropped his knife. Anne reached for it with her other hand. She got it, then slashed his other ankle, proceeded to stab it into the meat of his thigh. This time the man fought back. He caught her hand in his. He held her there. His mouth pinched shut, but the sweaty tick beneath gave lie to his confident facade. She twisted the knife and pushed it deeper. The man howled and let go of her hand. Anne brought the scissors down on what she thought would be the top of his head, but he looked up. Why did he have to look up? The scissors went straight into his eye and buried the tip somewhere into the skull beneath. Barely audible, he whimpered. Why was this happening to him? She pulled the brass-handled blade from, the le- from his leg and stabbed him in the throat. She could not, would not, retrieve the scissors. Just then the man with the gun came in. Looks like I'll have to look for this thing by myself. I won't be needing you or your kid anymore. Say goodbye to him. It looked bad. She would have to act. At least he was away from Kenny, who was left crying on the kitchen table. The man beneath her slumped, and his the life abandoned him in rebellious spurts. Good riddance. The wheel made a sharp turn, and Emmett almost pushed the button to open the garage door, but something was wrong. There was an itchy spot in the middle of his back that began to almost vibrate. Not almost, it was vibrating. He got out of the car and walked toward the front door. The curtains were drawn, and there was a shouting from inside. People he didn't know. Oh, God. He didn't go in the garage, but Anne and Kenny would probably be in there, too. If something was to be done, it was now. This was the time to call the authorities. The vibration on his back changed. Like a warm bath, an unwelcome pleasure washed over him. Let me help. A voice seemed to say, a voice that sounded to Emmett like a combination of a swarm of bees and a whale song. Every muscle tensed up, and the world washed away. In the darkness, events presented themselves in quick, violent flashes. Arms and tongues stretched impossibly long, coming back slick and hot. There was a scream, too. After a time, Emmett felt something pushing his nose. It was still dark, but then that was because his eyes were closed. He was lying face down on the wooden floor. This was the hall in front of the spare room. Jesus, Emmett, what's happening? It was Anne who spoke. Anne with Kenny in one arm and blood on her free hand. Kenny was crying and Emmett stood up. There were two men on the ground. There were two bloody men on the ground who were dead. The first had a shaved head lying on his back. His hands were on the floor ten feet away, with smears of blood behind them. The second was by the bed in the spare room. His, he had black hair, so black it could only have been dyed. There were scissors where his eye should be, and a second hole in his throat. His eye was wide open, his face pale, and his tongue, poking out of his mouth to the side, was blue. That was me, she said, shaking the, and pointing at the scissors. Daddy, Kenny was concerned. Daddy, he yelled again. You changed. You were different. Who were those people? I can explain, but we have to leave right now. The voice, bees and whales again. Was it just in his head? Did you hear that? Emmett asked Anne. Yes, I did. And of course I did. It came from you. And you must gather everything you need in the car. We have to leave. Emmett, go in the crawl space. The hatch to the crawl space was in the closet. They didn't like going down there. It was damp and unpleasant. They never kept anything in there. Sorry, I've been hiding something from you. He went down. There was an old footstool at the bottom step. He flipped on the light and continued down to the sandy floor. Go toward the opposite corner. Away from anything useful. Away from the water meter and any place he... he, would need to go, there was a burlap bundle. Emmett made his way to it. Now what? He asked as he started to unwrap it. There's no time for that. Bring it up. Take it to the car. It unnerved him more than a little that his voice was not just in his head. It spoke from his mouth. How could his voice sound like that? He had to trust it. It appeared that this thing had saved their lives. Emmett looked back at the bundle in his arms. How could he not have noticed this before? Because I never let you see it. I put it there. 
and I kept you from looking at it to protect you. Go ahead and take it. And that's my voice, my real physical voice traveling along your vocal cords like a telephone call. First, what are you? Put the package in the car and I will give you the memory back. Then you'll have your answer. Emma did as the voice asked. Anne had already begun packing her bags, first for Kenny, then herself, and loading the items into the back of the car. Her hands shook as she worked. Noticing this, she just worked harder and faster. Emmett noticed as he made his way to the garage a cold so intense that it burned, but there was pleasure in it too, a wave of endorphins. In his mind, Emmett floated to the garage, where the Subaru hatch was already open, and Anne was loading some bags inside. What the hell is that? Put it in the car and I'll show you. I'll show you both. Emmett did as the voice instructed, and as he set the package down, the contact broken, there was an ache to be with it again. Why would he feel this way? Without intending to, Emmett put his hand on Anne's shoulder, and the two of them disappeared together, to a memory from over twenty years ago. Like before, the world receded. They were there in Emmett's memory. He drove the old 1985 Blue Thunderbird up the Alaska Highway on the long road between Vancouver and Whitehorse. They both recognized the trip immediately. The year they moved to Alaska from Washington State. They were going there for college together, with all their stuff in the trunk. Although they were lost in this memory, it still felt like watching a movie. They were observers, not participants. Can we switch drivers? I'm starting to get sleepy. Emmett began pulling the car over. I guess you've decided already? Oh, sorry. No, I have to go to the bathroom, too. Okay, well, me too. They went off in opposite directions. Emmett's bladder felt tight as a drum, and it was a relief as he soaked the base of a pine tree for a good minute. Something ahead made the brush swish, and the branches crackle. He worried a little about bears. This was miles and miles of wild country, and it wasn't inconceivable that he could be mauled by a bear or trampled by a moose. They had already seen four moose and two mountain goats along the, the road on this trip. The thing came at him. As he pushed aside the vegetation, it became clear that it was a man, scruffy, dressed in clothes that looked more like old rags. He had a tall bundle close to his chest, holding it there with one arm while the other arm dangled, bloody at his side. His face was pained. He had a long beard, and his skin was unnaturally pale. Emmett interrupted the memory. That's the bundle I just put in the car? Yes. The memory didn't wait for discussion. The sickly man looked Emmett in the eyes and headed straight for him. Please, please help. Oh God, are you all right? Emmett saw the man a little closer, and it wasn't just his arm that was bloody. His pants were black with blood and the left side as well. There was something strange about the way he walked. From his side, there was a red-orange insect-like leg stepping where his own bloody leg stepped. The man saw him, looking at it. Better than a crutch, he grumbled, closing his eyes for a second as he stopped. Now that I'm stopped, I don't feel well, not well at all, Emmett interrupted the memory again. Why don't I remember this? It's there, but I've kept you from going to it. You've never told me any of this, Anne added. I wish I had remembered. The memory continued. The man, his eyes closed, began to sway slightly. From the same side as the crustacean leg, another jutted out suddenly and connected with the ground. It steadied him and kept him from pitching forward. The man's neck slumped and he dropped his burden. A large, crab-like pincer arm flew out of his shoulder blade and expertly caught the bundle before it hit the ground. Please take this. That voice, Emmett now recognized as the voice inside him. Back in the memory, Emmett knew without understanding that this was something important. He took it. He should have felt fear, and maybe there was some of that in, this, in the rush of adrenaline he felt, but there was something else, too. Emmett was awestruck at the miracle before him, but he could also feel concern for the poor teetering man. Relieved of his burden, the man collapsed on the ground. The two legs and claws withdrew into the body and disappeared. He twitched and convulsed. From the folds of the bloodied rags came a small, impossible thing. Its eyes were black on two long stalks. 
There were six pointy legs on an elongated, almost slug-like body. The thing had two crab claws. Its right was huge, and the left was about one-third the size. The mouth was a vertical oval, with tiny thorn teeth constantly extending and retracting. Wait, that's you? Although she was transfixed by the moment, and had interrupted, you're a parasite? I'm a mutualist. Why humans? Why not some other kind of animal? Because humans can live 250 to 300 years. No, they can't. You can, you just don't. With a little housekeeping from me, you'd be surprised what you're capable of. Back in the memory, the little crab on top of the man's body grew. Impossibly, it grew to ten times its original size. At this size, Emmett was acutely aware that the larger of its pincers could cut him in half. He was transfixed. If he ran, that surely would provoke it. But was staying any better? They looked at each other for what seemed like an age, but was actually less than a minute. Without even breaking eye contact, and without warning, one of the legs pointed at Emmett. It grew and telescoped toward him like a radio antenna. Although it stabbed through his shirt, the skin, flesh, and bones beneath parted without pain or blood or violence. From inside, he could feel tiny cilia wrapping around his spine. His worry melted. Then the voice. The same voice he had heard coming from the man. I'm happy to find you're not an invader. We've crossed paths by happy accident. This time the voice spoke directly in his mind. Let me join with you. We combine our powers into one. In return, you must protect the package. Emmett was still holding the bundle, cradled low in his arms. What happened to him? More of your kind. Invaders have destroyed my home, my Midian. I removed most of the bullets from him and was trying to repair the damage, but he lost too much blood. How long did he live? 177 years. We became great friends. It's a kind of marriage. Tears were close, even though he had never met this man. I'm so sorry. Thank you. I don't mean to burden you with my feelings. I've only just now come to the realization myself. We've traveled so far, thinking only of survival. It wasn't my intention for you to grieve with me. I think... I think yes, but first I need to know how dangerous it is protecting this whatever it is. We will be hiding, and I will protect you. Emmett's thoughts went to Anne. Yes, her too. Then I agree. That being said, the creature flung itself in toward him, diminishing in size midair and scrambling through the tiny hole it had made with his leg. The pseudo-wound closed with no mark or reminder that it had ever been there in the first place. The memory suddenly stopped, and they were back in the garage again, Kenny fussing in the car seat. The impossible voice was once again coming from Emmett's mouth. From that moment on, I have protected you from the knowledge of me, and you had no memory of that moment. Anne spoke up again. You know, I was not that far away. You could have asked me first. Emmett thought for a moment, and the current danger his family was in. His first thought was selfish and went unspoken. You're right. Of course you're right. All we can do now is keep Kenny safe. Anne had questions, too. He did not get the bundle in the car and travel with it for thousands of miles without her seeing it. And into the future, there were several household moves. No one noticed or mentioned it. My name is Jerry Cabo, by the way. After 23 years, it's nice to meet the both of you, again. I'm sorry for keeping the two of you in the dark. I wanted to protect you, but now it seems we're beyond that. With Anne at the wheel, they backed out of the garage. Where were they going to go? They would have to figure that out on the way. Before she could ask, the two were flung to the right side of the car, as the car was struck from the right rear bumper and spun around clockwise in the driveway. An old 90s maroon minivan blocked the way behind them. The door slid open and the first of the two men hopped out. He had a submachine gun and his eyes, which matched his hair, were yellow. Get Kenny down as low as you can. We have to stop them here before more come. Emmett and Jerry Cabo got out of the car together. 
Jerry made Emmett remove his shirt. No more hiding. But you'll have to let me take the wheel, so to speak. He addressed the blonde, yellow-eyed man who seemed incredulous. I like confusing people. Watch. This he seemed to say directly into Emmett's mind. The men inside sent us out. They said we needed to talk to the boss. Are you the boss? Yellow Eyes lowered his gun slightly and said, What the hell? And that's when Jerry struck. He lurched forward, crouching down while the large right pincher emerged from his shoulder blade and severed the man's gun arm, his right arm just below the elbow. It fell to the ground and the gun fired two bullets into the brush near the driveway's entrance. He looked at his stump, now squirting blood. There was something supposed to be there, and it wasn't. Before he had time to come to his senses, his head was neatly snipped off as a second thug jumped from the van. The woman was even less prepared than the first. She was reaching for her, the handgun in her holster as she was impaled straight through the chest by one of Jerry's legs. A second leg went between her eyes and exited out the base of her spine. Jerry was removing it as she fell face down on the pavement and Jerry took her place in the door. In this time, Anne had unbuckled Kenny and was holding him close, crouching down on the rear driver's side as close to the floor as they could get. She couldn't see anything, which was maddening, her view blocked by the child seat from which she had just removed Kenny. Kenny held his mother close, shaking silently. For Emmett, the sensation of being controlled by Jerry was like having his knee tapped with a mallet. He could feel the movements of his body and the crab-like limbs sliding in and out of it, but it wasn't his will making it happen. Inside the van, there was a pale, disfigured man strapped to the center rear seat. He was dressed in plain gray clothes and had no legs and only one arm. When and how he lost these limbs was a mystery, but Jerry Cobble remembered him. This was the priest from the fall of Midian. At his feet was another wrapped parcel like the one in the back of their car. The same, but different. It made a five-foot L-shape of Berlin. All of Jess and Jerry's limbs came out at once, and he took hold of the parcel and hugged it close. The crippled priest, Ashbury, Jerry's thoughts provided the name, turned his glassy eyes towards Emmett. Burn you, burn you all away. As he opened his mouth, Emmett and Jerry Cabo could see that his teeth had been melted black and fused together in two short rows. With white sparks ignited the priest's mouth, and Emmett was awestruck and froze in place. Oh, no, you don't. Whether Jerry was talking to him or the crippled man, who even now had a white liquid fire dribbling down his face, Emmett didn't know. He felt his body jump back, and outside, Jerry Cavo tripped over the lady corpse. White burning vomit blackened the, and cracked the windshield, and through the door, Emmett could see the seats of the steering and the steering wheel blister and break apart. It was a fire that was both cold and hot in turns. They felt it even outside. Time to go. Jerry Cavo picked up the wrapped thing and loaded it into the car just as the madman in the backseat of the van yelled, Burn you! Burn you all! I can smell you, Nightbreed, and I will find you and burn you! The road was an endless vista of fall colors on the birch aspen trees. The road was an endless vista of fall colors on the birch and aspen trees. Red, yellow, orange, all as far as the eye could see. This would not last long. Winter always came fast and hard, and they would be ready. Jerry told them that there would be more of Ashbury's group, and that they needed to head south. There would be other night breed that could help them. There was one stop to make in Canada, of course. I have to see it again. After all these years, I want to see my Midian, unmade. It was a three-hour detour across Peace River, through Sheer Neck to Midian. The sun had set now and the, on the third day of their journey. The gates were still intact, but inside was a crater. The fence around Midian covered acres and acres of land, and at its center was a sinkhole of wrecked stone and dirt. There were, of course, still tombs around its perimeter of varying shapes and sizes. Emmett felt tears close, but he didn't know why. They stepped just inside the gates, and he took Anne's hand. He never knew this place, this Midian, but it felt like home. A tiny buzzing sound, like a wind-up toy, distracted Emmett, 
and the tears never came. What is that? They looked down, and what looked like a mechanical millipede on caliper legs busted, buzzed across the ground and across Emmett's feet. Hello, friend, Jerry said. He reached down to scoop up the creature, but it had other business. It deftly dodged his hand coming toward it, and ran up the stone wall beside the gate. Somehow, it had footholds in the stone as it ran vertically. Then it circled around and around a place where there had been something carved into the stone. A strange writing, like a combination of simplified Chinese and Egyptian hieroglyphs. What is that? Anne asked. Looks like a message. Did you write this, friend? Realizing that it was being addressed, the mechanical millipede looked up at them. Looking closer, they could see that it had a little silver face of a mountain lion. It nodded its head. I can read this. Hold on. It's jumpish, taught to us by Baphomet. To all the tribes of the moon, we are gathered in, the, in North Carolina. There we hope that you will join us to assemble the baptizer, so that he can reappear to the world as you've never seen him before, made whole. Cabal and I, among many more of the tribes, will be waiting for you. If you are protecting one of his parts, please bring it. Together, we are strong. Lori. Now we knew where to go. Will you come with us, Marcus? You know, we now have two pieces of Baphomet. Can you come look? Jerry Cavo stopped and looked at Anne. Someone is watching through Marcus's eyes. Knows we're here. A friend, of course. They went back to the car and opened the rear hatch. On top of the their luggage, the two burlap parcels sat. Here is my burden. They unwrapped the parcel on the ground behind the car. It was a left hand and an arm severed at the elbow, dark with clawed fingers, the palm at least 18 inches across. This is what's been in our crawl space all these years. Emmett couldn't turn his gaze away from the hand. Marcus went to the second parcel, the one that they got from the van. Yes, Let's see what Ashbury was carrying. They unwrapped it, and inside was an arm. It looked like a left arm. Kenny, who had been quiet all this time, kneeled down and pushed the upper arm across the burlap and pushed it together, where it seemed to be severed from the hand at the elbow. His face deadly serious, which Emmett and Anne recognized as the face he made when putting together puzzles. The wounds lined up. It was a match. Daddy, help. Kenny was trying to get the two pieces to connect, but they would not stick together. Jerry Cavo addressed the mechanical beast now. This was Onaka's piece. It was his responsibility, but after he died, I don't know what took his place. Whoever it was, I imagine they are gone now. They wrapped them up together into one package and loaded them back to the car. The creature, Marcus, went back to the gate and circled around again and again the message in jumpish. They followed and could see that as it circled, it carved the circle around it as well, emphasizing it. They supposed for anyone else who came along. Does this mean you'll join us? Marcus climbed up Emmett's leg and rested on his shoulder. Daddy, hold it! Ken Kenny was pointing at Marcus. That meant he wanted to hold the creature for himself. Kenny, Marcus is our friend, not a toy. After a beat, there was a quiet sound. Was it a laugh that came from Marcus? They would continue to travel south, knowing that if they were to find more Nightbreed and help assemble the architect, there were still enemies. It had been 23 years since the fall of Midian, since Baphomet was lost. Now this message from Lori was evidence that maybe the world was ready for the Nightbreed, ready to see the tribes of the moon and their baptizer properly. In the coming year, Cabal would call to all the breed, and surprisingly, with the help of her repentant and reformed Sons of the Free, they would find a new home. They would assemble the God, and the world would marvel. After 23 years, it was time to come home. A new home, because Midian was unmade. Maybe the world would be better for it. Some of the breed had become accustomed to the routine in their new lives, but the call of the tribes would stir up their cold blood and remind them of that important lesson they learned so long ago. No home is forever.